official council meeting. It will be uh, streamed live and recorded, uh, but there will be no public presentation. I encourage those that do have questions or comments to email us at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. We are doing this under the emergency determination by the Governor Waltz and under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021. Um, and as a start, I think uh, either Bridget or uh, uh, Liz might uh, call the roll so we can call ourselves to order. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, lovely, thanks Bridget. Now I cannot hear you. Are others hearing uh, Bridget? Because I cannot. No. no. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. We did for just a second. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, Shambliss? Here. Cummings? Here. Ferguson? Here. Fredson? Here. Gonzalez? Gonzalez? Johnson? Johnson? Here. Lee? Here. Lilligren? Here. Lindstrom? Here, and also Councilmember Zirin just sent me a text letting me know he will not be present and asked me to <laughs> tell you that he will not be, make it. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Muse? Here. Sterner? Here. Vento? Here. Wolf? Here. Terzelli? I'm here. Uh, I think you see before you uh, the agenda. We need no uh, motion or roll call unless anybody has any objection. Uh, but we're on to approval of the minutes. And that's the minutes from our regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole on January 20th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Cummings moves approval. Vento seconds. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings and Vento. Um, any corrections, changes? If not, uh, Bridget, let's call the roll to approve the minutes. Atlas Ingebrigtsen? Barber? Aye. Shambliss? Aye. Cummings? I think that was me. Aye. Yes. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Johnson? <laughs> Lee? Aye. Aye. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Muse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Chair Zelli? Aye. Well, the minutes uh, are approved. Um, so we'll get into the heart of our meeting. Uh, I uh, am really appreciative of the uh, governor's senior staff coming uh, and spending some time with us. Um, you know, often uh, we uh, describe uh, the Metropolitan Council as an independent uh, regional government, not a state agency. But it turns out we are all appointed by the governor and we are a cabinet agency. And we feel very close to both the goals, the vision, the direction of Governor Walt. And uh, I know from my own cabinet work uh, how uh, inspiring, fulfilling that is. And, and when we talk about uh, the One Minnesota Plan, 
the governor's vision, it is so uh, aligned with Thrive and our own strategic work. Uh, so I feel very much that Met Council is part of that, um, that effort. So it's uh, important. Of our four goals is equity, uh, not in the in how we are managing our various work, but how we think about our uh, all aspects of the region, not just Metropolitan Council's work, but uh, the leadership in, in many ways that we can provide. Uh, my hats off to the BIPOC members, council members, who started this conversation this summer uh, to understand more closely how we are aligned uh, with the governors and uh, and the state work, and. Um, and uh, we know we can continue to do that, but I, it was really great for uh, Chris Schmitter, the Governor's Chief of Staff, to uh, kick off and spend some time with us talking about the One Minnesota vision and plans and goals. And then also uh, Chris Taylor, who's going to be with us, who um, uh, is really the, the, he was the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Governor. Uh, talking about again uh, what the, the governors and the state uh, agencies are, are doing. And then also uh, Nick Dahlia Loyola is thrilled that you could be with us and get into the, the real substance of that, of that work. So I'm not going to stand in the way. We, I did mention we do have a hard stop at 440. Um, so I hope we'll hear from them, maybe have time for a little conversation. And uh, I'll kick it back uh, to you, Chris Schmetter. Thank you, Chris. Hey, thank you, Charlie, and, and thanks, everybody. Can you all hear me all right? Yes, good. Okay, great. And you'll have to you have to forgive me for two things. One, I am in my three-year-old's room, which is why I have these clouds painted on the wall behind me. And so I'm, so I'm just, like many of you, I think I'm kind of moving around my house depending on the day. And she's she's home from child care today, so I'm doing a little double duty. So if she comes running in, I apologize. Uh, and But sitting in, in the room with the clouds works okay because it sort of keeps me uplifted and positive about what's happening. So that's, that's, that's number one. Number two, I would just say, you know, thank you for uh, the incredible work that you all do and the leadership you provide uh, for this great uh, region of our great state. And, um, and thank you for giving me and Chris Taylor and McDonnell Loyola uh, the chance to come speak with you today. Um, uh, because I think that's important, and I'm grateful to, to some of you for asking for that in particular, that, that kind of engagement, uh, more engagement, frankly, with the governor's office, and we're eager and excited to do it. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your leadership, your work, your public service, and thank you for inviting us here today. So, um, you know, I think my hope would be to touch on uh, our kind of strategic planning process over the course of the last two years, and then touch a bit on um, sort of equity as a component of that in particular, and then hand it off to Chris and Medallia to, to make some points as well, and then uh, open, you know, uh, uh, welcome questions and discussion. Um, so I guess what, you know, what I would start with is this. I've had the, the privilege and the honor of, of knowing and, and, and being a, a friend to and, and an advisor to some extent to both the governor and the lieutenant governor, Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan, uh, each sort of independently now for, for more than 15 years. And it has been uh, an incredible joy to get to work with and for both of them in a variety of contexts uh, over the years. And um, knowing them as I do, it wasn't a surprise to me when, when they uh, kind of joined forces back in 2017 to run for governor and lieutenant governor. And uh, it was a uh, frankly, a joy and an honor for me to be a part of that campaign, and, and an incredible honor when they asked me to serve as chief of staff. You know, I, I uh, had worked extensively for the governor when he was in Congress and, and run his Washington office, and and so had experience really digging in with him. But but like I said, really had had the chance to work with both of them in different capacities. And so when we you know when we started um, on the transition now more than two years ago into office, and then. In the administration, um, you know, I think one thing was was clear, which is that as you come into office, <clears throat> you have to focus right away on building a budget. As an incoming governor, you have just a handful of weeks to do it, and that is a critical focus: your budget and your policy for that first session. But I think, and Chris and McDonnell can can speak to this as well. The governor and lieutenant governor are also both big believers in in strategic planning. 
and in being proactive about setting some priorities, setting some quantifiable goals, um, uh, because you know what 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 we care about uh, is often reflected in what we measure, and oftentimes enough, what we measure actually gets done. And so, you know, from the get go, and, and I'll say I think they both heard from from lots of folks in state government and beyond that your time in office is short. And if you get too focused on the issues, the sort of reactive issues of the day and uh, of just victories or not at session, uh, that time can pass really quickly and you might not have the impact that you hope to uh, when you're in office. And there's this incredible enterprise in state government of amazing people doing work every day. And you have the power to work with them to set them goals and, and set some goals and go out and achieve those goals, whether or not X bill or Y bill gets passed at the legislature. And so, I'm sorry, my three-year-old's yelling in the background about Paw Patrol, so I, I forgive me for that. But so, so we started off on that almost right away. I mean, just just two days before um, the inauguration of Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, we started off first by by trying to build for our for our cabinet. We got the whole incoming cabinet together, and we tried to build some, you know, first off, just some sort of overarching principles some guardrails, if you will, guiding principles, if you will, about, about how we do our work that would help define it. So, you know, again, I, you know, a lot of different approaches to strategic planning. The governor's preference is be clear about your, your mission, your vision, your priorities, uh, your strategies, but also be clear about those guiding principles that are gonna govern our work. And so he had done a lot of work on that when he was in Congress. We took a lot of the principles that applied um, and defined his work in Congress try to distill those into, into a page um, and, and sort of talked about that right from the get-go. Okay, what are the principles that are gonna govern uh, this time in office? And then uh, the following summer in 2019, got everybody together again, and we distilled those even further to, okay, what are a handful of really core guiding principles that should, that should govern our work and our decision-making um, across the board? And so we've shared with you a, a one Minnesota plan building blocks document and you see on there some guiding principles. I would just say that's a good, you know, just it's it's a helpful place to start because those are, um, you know, the, the, those like I say are some, you know, it's uh, some almost like bumpers and bowling, if you will, some guardrails that the governor believes are really critical to doing work and keeping us on track. From from practicing servant leadership to you see them right there, that guiding principles portion. From practicing servant leadership to doing what's right even when it's difficult to asking how decisions you make, uh, uh, you know, sort of talking to folks who are affected by decisions you make before you make them. And so, and so in addition to coming up with those, to sort of refining and working on a set of guiding principles that reflect the governor, lieutenant governor, and the whole cabinet, and tried to kind of define and, and provide guardrails for our work, we then spent time working on, okay, uh, uh, clear agenda, one Minnesota agenda from the campaign trail over the course of two years. Now, what does that mean when we put it into practice uh, in government? What's the one Minnesota plan, if you will? And again, this is going higher level and longer term than that initial budget in 2019, for example. And so, um, so in doing that, like I said, spent a lot of time with the governor, lieutenant governor, reflecting on their, their campaigning across the state for two years and their first six months of work in office and developed um, and then worked with the cabinet kind of across the board pretty extensively and a lot of senior staff in the governor's office, including Chris and Medallia. And we developed a, a mission, as the governor thinks of it, sort of you know, what we do and kind of what we do every day. And, and that mission is to, to improve the lives of Minnesotans uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively. And that collaboration piece is a critical part of that one Minnesota vision he laid out for the state uh, to implement policies that achieve results for Minnesotans. And then vision, what is, what, what's our vision of success if, if we're going to work you know, to doing work every single day. Well, what, what's the world, if you will, that we're trying to achieve? And no surprise for a, uh, a, a teacher governor uh, whose wife is a teacher, whose whole family is made up of teachers, a lieutenant governor who's a former school board advocate and state leading uh, uh, advocate for children, that their, that their vision for our state, their sort of one Minnesota vision, which they've heard about as they traveled the state to every single corner, is making our state the very best in the country. For our kids to grow up in, um, uh, 
uh, and, and so they really uh, uh, wanted to hone in on, okay, how, how do we do that, right? How, how, do, we, how do we create a, and that, of course, parts of that were um, obviously key in that first budget, which focused a lot on education funding, but they want to be sure that this state is one that is the best state in the country for our kids to grow up in, and, and those of all races, those of all ethnicities, of religions, of economic statuses, of gender identities, of sexual orientations, disabilities, and zip codes. Uh, it has to be a state that is uh, the best state in the country for our kids to grow up in um, very powerfully. And so they laid out that vision working with the entire cabinet. And then we took from that and laid out a set of priorities uh, around uh, 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 in kind of five key areas. And and I would just say then, you know, then um, I'll, I'll circle back, but, I, you know, then something happened, which is as, as we as we finished that work, and we built this plan. We then went a step further and started to develop key interagency leaders in each of these areas who could lead interagency work. We set some quantifiable goals under those priority areas, um, under that overall vision. Uh, uh, we built a more fleshed out strategic plan for the administration and we had each agency, including obviously Met Council, revise and refresh their own strategic plans. And some like you all have longer term plans already, but tried to get you thinking about, okay, in the time we have, when this governor's in office, what's your plan and how does it relate back to the one Minnesota plan? And then, and then uh, I was sort of going around to every agency a little under a year ago talking about this effort. And then wouldn't you know it, uh, COVID hit that exact week, we had our first case in Minnesota. And so we had to take a little bit of a pause. At that point, we were doing a weekly goal review session around quantifiable goals that stem from these priority areas um, and spending time each week. So on, 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 a, on a given goal, for instance, we'd get every agency and state government that we could that, that touches on an area we were focused on in a room together in the cabinet room talking about how to make progress on that goal. And I think most of the folks who've been engaged in it feel like it's, it's meaningful work that, um, that is crossing agency silos. Uh, then COVID hit. And so then we, we, we took a step, uh, as, as you all may know, uh, kind of took a step back and had to focus, as you do sometimes in state government, on the reactive. And so we spent months really, you know, sort of pivoting. And, and as you've seen across the country, states have really had to stand up and lead on this pandemic. Um, but we've come back to this work, and I think we've come back to it even more aggressively in the last few months. And so we came back to uh, uh, this set of mission, vision, and priorities I think the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the cabinet felt just as passionate, even more so, about making this mission and vision a reality. Um, and then we revised our priorities to reflect the moment that we're in, um, uh, focusing on, on the health of Minnesotans and that COVID-19 pandemic, our economy and building back out of it, continue to focus on kids and families, prioritizing equity inclusion, um, and, and, and equity being, frankly, uh, uh, the, the, the lens being even clearer. Uh, and, and the urgency being even clearer after the death of George Floyd and what our state has faced in the last year, uh, fiscal accountability and measurable results and our environment and our climate. So you see those priorities laid out. So we revised it. Each agency kind of revised their plan to reflect the moment that we're in, as you know. Um, and then uh, we kicked off those goal review sessions again around quantifiable goals that flow from those priorities. And, uh, uh, you know, as I said, agencies have, have kind of revised their own strategic plans and are working on those. And uh, our hope is to get a good cadence going of the governor's office sitting down with agencies, looking at their plans, seeing how they're making progress toward them, and then helping them make progress toward their goals. And again, trying to be as quantifiable as we, as we possibly can, because we know if we, if, if we sort of set quantifiable goals and, and work toward them, all the better. We also realized that a lot of the baselines that we set a year ago in coming up with quantifiable goals have changed given the last year uh, and what's happened in this state and in our country and across the world. So that's, um, that's that one Minnesota plan piece broadly and uh, grateful for the work that I know all of you and the Met Council had, and, and, and Charlie and, and others on staff have done uh, on your own sort of, you know, your own strategic plan as, and, and how it relates to the one Minnesota plan under the broader to thrive plan that you all are working under. And I get that that's something that Met Council does well. As you may or may not know, some state agencies, when we embarked on this a couple of years ago, um, had never had an agency strategic plan to begin with. And so for some, there was more need here, um, but grateful for the work that, that you all have done. Um, 
so that, then I would say, then I would, uh, you know, hone in a, a little bit more specifically on on equity and and how equity is um, uh, sort of reflected as a priority and on some specific goals, um, and then how you know uh, even as we were finalizing this plan and working on it back in 2019, we tried to really embed it in the work that we're doing ongoing. Um, so I'll just speak to that. So so one would be as a, as a priority area, you know, and, and Chris and McDalia and others in state government have really helped a lot with this. We focused in, in, in two obvious areas that I'll mention around equity and state government and sort of leveraging the enterprise that we have and the power that it has uh, around equity. And, and some of this I think lines up with, with uh, your own, um, as I read it from your plan, your own reducing racial disparities goal and the strategies you're deploying. So one is around retention and Chris Taylor could speak to this better than anybody uh, because the Dayton administration made huge progress in diversifying our workforce in the state. Uh, but we also know that uh, state government has had difficulty in terms of uh, retaining employees generally and retaining uh, uh, employees of color in particular. And so um, uh, we've set a target to retain employees uh, to try you know, to, to just in general improve retention but specifically try to get to a 75% retention of employees who start with the enterprise for more than two years. And, and Chris can, can, can speak to it more. Um, but, but that's been helpful in, in a variety of ways. One, it's helped Chris and he'll speak to it, go in and strategize with agencies about how to get that work done and build a workplace that reflects the, the workforce of our state and especially the direction that we're headed. But two, it's helped us ask other questions from a data standpoint. So um, when you start talking about retention, you immediately start thinking about, okay, well, uh, what do we know about uh, <clears throat> about why folks leave state government if we're having issues around retention? And we know that we have an exit survey. And again, I just acknowledge up front that obviously Met Council has its own sort of set of you know, structures and, and rules and procedures, which we can talk about as, you know, it's not, as you said, Charlie, not a state agency. So, uh, but I know that Chris is eager to work with you in the ways that he can as well. But so for the state exit survey, we've really challenged each of our commissioners to say, we got to get a higher percentage of exit interviews than we were getting. We weren't having enough fill it out. And then once you get those exit interviews more and more of them, you can start to see, okay, X agency maybe is losing people because we don't predominantly, let's say as an example, because we don't pay enough. Um, but maybe Y agency is losing folks generally um, or, or specifically uh, uh, maybe work, uh, employees of color because um, because of, of issues around culture or uh, uh, sort of a welcoming workplace or what have you. And then, and then well, so what we're trying to do is set a goal, hold agencies accountable, um, but then also use that to drive, okay, where are we lacking the data to really track this, go get that data, and then assess where the problems are. And this is what, you know, a chunk of what Chris is doing every single day, and he can speak to it as well. The, the second strategy in our administration commissioner, Alice Roberts Davis, is just a phenomenal leader on this front. She's been doing this for years when she was an assistant commissioner under Governor Dayton and now has been to increase the amount of spend to targeted businesses, uh, um, you know, women-owned, veteran-owned, and BIPOC-owned businesses through state dollars. And I think this is a strategy that mirrors one that you all have deployed as well. Um, and as you may know, there's a state program for certifying certain businesses. Um, and so... Um, we're also, you know, this session working at the legislature to try to expand the use of that program, which helps. Um, but what we're doing is trying to set a target of, okay, we've seen actually some pretty great progress in the past four years on the amount of state dollars uh, going to these target businesses. Um, but we know we can keep making progress. And so we've, I think, I think in the last, you know, Chris or McDonough, correct me, but I think in the last few years, you know, since maybe 2017, it was a jump from, 4% to some 8% um, of, of spend. Now we want to get it up to, to 12% spend. Um, absolute dollars keep going up, which is good. Um, but we wanted the percentage, of course, helps us adjust kind of beyond just overall increase in state spending. So our focus then again is, okay, this to my point, if you focus only on the reactive or one session or another, you kind of forget what incredible leverage and, and ability state government has uh, like many of our private sector, you know, kind of companies in, in, in the in the sort of economy here in Minnesota to make change just through the levers that we have. And so those are two goals that we've set. And we've just recently done goal reviews on both of them. 
And what's interesting about it is once you start to dig down, you can see, okay, well, wait a second now. We might have an overarching goal, but maybe there are a few agencies that really stand out as having a, a huge impact um, on our retention or on our equity, uh, on our procurement spend, and that helps us target our efforts. The other piece I would just mention um, is, is even as we've you know, worked on this plan, um, there are some specific goals under equity and leveraging the enterprise. There are also um, under sort of kids and families, for instance, as you all may know, incredible health disparities in our state around infant and maternal, uh, uh, maternal mortality um, uh, for uh, mothers and infants, BIPOC mothers and infants, as opposed to white mothers and infants. So that's, that's also a targeted goal. So while we have some key equity goals that try to leverage the enterprise's hiring and spending power, we also have a number of other goals that are targeting, um, for instance, health disparities. Those are, those are issues where I know our health department is passionate about it, and I, I know that they've also had to 60% of our health department has been redeployed around COVID. So that's been a challenge, but it, we're, a lot of our goals sort of also have equity embedded. The other piece I would say, and McDonnell, I think could speak to this too, is our head of public engagement and someone who's been working on this since day one, two years ago, is even as we worked on this plan, you know, Commissioner Lucero, uh, our human rights commissioner, did a conversation around just decision-making with an equity lens at our very first um, cabinet meeting uh, as a group a couple days before the inaugural more than two years ago. And one question that we asked as we got out of the 2019 session is, how do we start to embed that in decision-making right away? And it's a question that Medallia puts to the whole cabinet as often as possible. The answer to that, it turns out, one, one strategy that we deployed is there's a form. It's a pretty dry form, the form A, that gets used to ask agencies for policy and budget recommendations. So within a couple of weeks of the 2019 session, ending and getting a budget deal done and everybody's caught up on sleep. Uh, Wayne Nguyen, our deputy chief for policy and ledge affairs, working with McDonnell and others, had incorporated a, 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 some key questions around equity into that form A. So that even as we were working on a strategic plan and still finalizing it, as we were preparing for the 2020 session, agencies had to be thinking about equity and talking about how proposals they were forwarding to the governor's office for 2020, um, uh, kind of the equity impact that they had. So that's, um, another piece that we tried to deploy right away. And then the obvious piece I would say too is we've had to bring a, 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 an equity lens to our COVID response efforts over the course of the last year. Rebecca Lucero, Chris Taylor, and Magdalia at different points have chaired our community resiliency and recovery effort, focusing on a number of areas from data and testing, translations, and so on. Um, and that's been key because as we've had to respond and focus on COVID, um, um, that, that's been you know, a, a critical effort. I think Magdalia would say too is you take testing alone We've, we've tried to expand our testing program as low and no barrier as possible to make testing to all sorts of Minnesotans because we know that if we didn't do that, um, you know, uh, communities of color disproportionately affected by the virus would actually see less testing uh, proportionally if we were just using traditional means. So I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry for uh, uh, taking up a little bit too much time. Chris, I'll hand it over to you. No, and I, and I Chris, I would just say uh, this is really inspiring and it's really helpful for us to hear. And, and Chris Medaglia, I, I'm kind of respectful because I know we have limited time. So, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, you, you could have a, some quick comments. And then I know some of the council members might have some, just a couple of questions. So, uh, yeah, that'd be great. So go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Thanks. Yep. Uh, thank you all uh, for allowing us to come in and speak with you. I think there's a couple of things that I'll add. Um, and, you know, so my work is really focused internally. Uh, the retention goal is what I'm thinking about every day. Medallia is kind of the counterpart for the external equity work. And so that's kind of how it's, it's divvied up, but it really allows us to, to focus in our, our areas, right? I come from an organization development and change background, and that's what we're doing. We're shifting cultures within agencies to be more inclusive so that we can retain the staff that we really need. Um, and I think the goal is to really impact our external through internal work that can help to um, help to 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 create external equity. Right. A um, couple of things I'll talk about just the one Minnesota Council. Uh, this was the very first executive order um, that was laid out by this administration. So we have a council of commissioners that meets monthly. Um, we're convening sub subcommittees um, and, and doing work that will be enterprise-wide, that will be looking at change that uh, applies to all agencies. And so that's kind of our, our macro 
approach. Um, and then, as Chris mentioned, the strategic plans that each agency uh, has laid out, within those strategic plans, there's goals for equity. And um, so my office also convenes a group that we call the DEI liaison group. And so it's a, it's a liaison from each agency that we work with um, to build out a plan around achieving those goals that are laid out in the strategic plan. And so, um, for instance, if, if it's something like we want to create a, race, a racial framework, we're going to lay that out step by step. We're going to figure out what that looks like to implement, and then we're going to support them in doing that. And so we are working on this both at that kind of macro enterprise level, um, but we're also looking at this from an agency by agency level, recognizing that agencies are in different spots in their journey need different things based on size type of work that kind of stuff so i think that's kind of what i would add and i'll i'll stop there and let uh migdalia talk a little bit about her work good afternoon everyone um nice to meet you i think that both chris's comments were pretty comprehensive and so what i will add is that public engagement one of the things that i have found to be so exciting and brilliant about this work is the collaboration and the expected partnership between Chris, State, Chris Taylor's work in that internal focused equity and inclusion thought process and implementation and how that is meant to also work really closely together with the public engagement work. And the goal of the public engagement department is to listen to communities experiences, their ideas and their concerns to bring their voices to the policy making process and enhance opportunities for their participation in decision making. Equity and inclusion are the heart of that. And um, as part of that, one of the things that um, we really value is being able to bring those voices, understanding that their experiences really can shape the decision making process so that the final policy and, and policies and procedures that we implement are taken into account their their experiences, their ideas, and things that will work to improve and lift up their lives. So that is a really important component of that. And um, as Chris um, Schmitter mentioned, two things that I would add is that besides having the equity goal, um, that is something that the agencies were asked to look at when they were formulating their policy ideas, they, one of the subsets of those questions is the question of how do you engage those most impacted by this decision into this in the proposal? Are, the, are there ideas that emerge out of your engagement with community? And again, another point of intersection in thinking through the, the general equity question, but also have you been in communication and have these ideas emerged? And if you haven't done that, tell us like, you know, where is this coming from them? So I find that to be also a really valuable part of the process. And like Chris mentioned, it's been just an honor to work with Chris Taylor and with Commissioner Lucero along the path of the Community um, Resilience and Recovery Work Group of the COVID-19 response, where we're trying to embed those same values into the COVID-19 response, especially in light of how we see that across the nation in Minnesota is not, um, abs this is also true in Minnesota, that the racial disparities in the COVID-19 response are very present. So thinking about equity in that response is another key component of how um, we've, we've been working over the last year on that. And I'll stop because I know we're short on time, but I'm happy to answer questions. No, thank you so much for your comments. Why don't we open it up? And uh, uh, I know uh, this is really a shy group. You're not, no, not at all. Uh, uh, anybody uh, have, a, have a, a question? Yeah, please, Abdi, uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, Thanks, uh, Chris and Chris and Magdalia, for coming out today and for your great update. Uh, generally, we are very pleased the great work we are doing here at the Met Council. Uh, but sometimes I feel, I fear uh, that we might not be pushing the envelope enough when it comes to the equity and inclusion. So in, it will be great if Chris, uh, the Chief of Staff, can reiterate government's commitment to that point. Uh, that's one, to, in one point I would like to highlight. The other point is uh, it's the area of, you know, uh, in hiring more people of color at the state agencies. As someone who previously worked at the city of Minneapolis, I think uh, getting hired and, you know, uh, getting into the uh, state workforce is the biggest barrier for uh, people of color 
because many of them don't have the professional network that their white counterparts have. So focusing on that entry level barriers and I think where are we really losing people and why people are not getting into will be really helpful, specifically for folks who uh, speak with accent like, like mine. Uh, you know, it will be really uh, helpful to ID the frontline entry level barriers for people of color. I'll stop right there. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, have, I had a, a visitor here grabbing me just for a second, but I, I, I would just say maybe to the to the first point, and then on, on the, the second point about about that 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 issue of of of, of hiring uh, is a really important one too. And I think Chris, you could speak to that because it, by focusing on retention, we've not we've not given up on the incredible work that the Dayton administration did to try to really increase uh, uh, sort of diversity in our hiring and as a result, reduce those barriers that you're, that you're speaking about. But I would say on, on pushing the envelope, you know, I think that the, I appreciate that point. And I think, I think I would say that the, you know, the, the governor and Lieutenant governor both agree. And part of why I'm walking through what we did over the last two years is they just fundamentally agree that we have to really use the time we have in office as much as we can to, to get things done. It doesn't mean that with all the stuff that's going on, we can accomplish every single thing we want to. But but part of why we did this process and a part of why I think you're doing the same to, to get exactly to your point about, about sort of pushing the envelope around equity is um, that they're both believers in setting that tone as leaders, but then also getting granular and talking about, okay, what does that mean? Let's set some quantifiable goals. Um, because part of the way we push the envelope is at a leadership level with a broad vision. And then part of the way they're both really believers in this, part of the way you do it is by actually setting a goal and, 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 and you know, coming, coming up with some metrics and holding folks accountable Can you for it. Yeah. So Just bad one though. second, sweetheart. Just one second. You know, if, if, if you, you know, I think that's, the, they're, they realize the critical nature of um, to, to push that envelope and achieve something, you've got to do both and really uh, uh, set some goals around the time we have together in office and then hold our leaders accountable for getting them done within our whole state government enterprise. And, and so that, I think I, I totally agree on the need to do it. And I think one of the ways to do it is to be as concrete as we can and use data. And, and the results team, the data team at MMB, for instance, who, who Charlie has worked with in the past, is, has been essential in sort of drawing out of agencies or our state government, okay, what data do we have to help us push the envelope, just as you're saying. Chris, maybe you can speak to the, the, the second point about hiring and barriers to hiring. Yep, and, and I appreciate that. And we've not we've not walked back from hiring at all. And in fact, I just reviewed um, um, some guidance that's being developed around the hiring process and intercultural competence in the hiring process, mitigating bias in the hiring process. Um, and so that's one piece of it, right? Um, is, is guidance or setting expectations. And then I think, you know, there's about there's changing behaviors and we can do that through some training, but then also accountability, right? And thinking about what those systems are if you um, have a pool that's diverse um, and you don't hire somebody, having a conversation about why did we not hire someone who was diverse? And maybe there's legitimate reasons for that, but maybe there aren't and being able to to develop this process. And so we are, we are working on that. <clears throat> We're working on things like, um, developing minimum qualifications for intercultural competence. So somebody who speaks multiple languages and has a, a, a wealth of experience working across cultures, that will be weighted as a minimum qualification um, and things of that nature. So there's a lot to do with the hiring um, and we are doing that work and you know, we we'll, we'll can hope to continue to see results. I wonder if we can indulge you with just two more quick questions. I know uh, Chris Ferguson had his hands up, and uh, Linnea, your second right after, because I've seen your two hands. That'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Charlie, just a, I guess a quick comment and, and maybe a question around the spend part. But you know, I think if you look at the data that, that's going on as a result of COVID, um, you know, our, our racial inequity gaps are widening. And I think the numbers likely would, would indicate that people of color are worse off today than they were when Governor Walls got elected. So in the next two years, there's obviously a lot of work to reverse that trend and to get people of color back in on, on the positive side over the four years of the Walls administration. I'd just be curious 
um, what more you guys plan to do to, to make that happen. The second thing is just on the spend. Everybody gets excited about spend and the DB numbers and our MCUB numbers. 90%, 75 to 90% of that spend is with white women. So connecting that DBE spend to reducing racial inequities is just a, it, there's no correlation, right? So you have to, you have to disaggregate the data and understand where the state is spending with BIPOC businesses and not look at the DBE that the existing DBE programs haven't worked for 40 years of reducing racial inequities in the state of Minnesota. And so continuing to do them as we've done them in the past. Um, well, one just quick policy thought, you know, we've, we, and we've talked about this with Commissioner Grove, but angel BIPOC businesses often struggle to get capital. We've asked about, you know, having the angel tax credit, tax credit apply to BIPOC businesses. Um, I think it would be an easy way to, um, for, the, for the governor and for the administration to um, help get additional capital into these businesses so they can grow and expand so we can have more than the 20 or so that over 10 million in revenue, which is all we have in the state of Minnesota uh, today. So. Um, just just a couple of quick thoughts on on thinking about growing that economy and expanding those jobs and getting us back on the right side as we as we move out of the pandemic. I would maybe just if I could, and then we'll come to the last question. But I just I appreciate that. And, and first, I would say so. Maybe I'll start at the at the I'll start first with the point on 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 procurement and spend. Hundred percent agree. Totally right. And and uh, it'd be great, to, you know, it'd be great to have Commissioner Roberts Davis come and speak about this in particular because she's the expert here. But we do disaggregate the data, and you're exactly right. Uh, although I think she would say that in doing that in recent years, that has helped them then target their uh, target their the admin department has targeted its in this sort of certified business uh, targeted business category under the statutory scheme target their support toward certain segments of businesses? And do they make up a, a, enough of a percentage of that, of that procurement spend? No, but they've seen significant increases, for instance, in the amount of um, money going to indigenous businesses. And so that, that I, think, I think Commissioner Roberts Davis would say, we've seen some success exactly because we did what you said, which is you have to disaggregate. You can't just, you can't lump everybody together. And then you've got to really target um, through programming um, and making connections, uh, uh, BIPOC-owned businesses to increase that spend. And I think that the data, uh, Alice would say, shows some, some real success, um, for instance, around our indigenous-owned businesses, but, but more to do on that point. So totally agree, and Commissioner Roberts Davis can speak to it better than I can. And then I think on the, on, on the I, I mentioned that I think that our our, our baselines and as a result, our targets on a lot of these goals have changed because of what the last year has done. And we've seen both the recession and uh, the pandemic uh, disproportionately impact Minnesotans of color. So there again, I you know, appreciate you raising that point. And I think, so So I think from the administration standpoint, you know, how do you tackle that and, and how do you make progress? Uh, uh, um, uh, I, I think one of the most obvious ways is uh, restarting a process that we've done of, of setting concrete goals, realizing that our baseline has changed, many of which center on equity, and then having that kind of reflected in the budget, right? And so um, I think what we have seen from both the school finance work group, the education roundtable that a whole bunch of different partners convened over the last three months, and then the education goals embedded in the plan is that while we know that that uh, that our baselines and our targets, everything has gotten worse over the course of the last year because of what we've experienced. There's all sorts of research on this in Minnesota and beyond, and we'll learn more in the years to come. Um, uh, you know, we also know as a result of that and having some of these goals and restarting this process, I think the, uh, our education team, along with a lot of external partners, built a budget that was uh, more, you know, more targeted uh, in terms of, okay, we have money on the education formula, for instance, but we also have money uh, for uh, wraparound services. We also have money for targeted grants for four and five-year-olds for the summer. We have money targeted at sort of inequities and in property taxes to sort of supplement uh, the formula. And, and some of that is really big. The education sort of uh, package in the budget is, is hundreds of millions. Um, and then some of it is, 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 is minuscule, but I tell you what, this plan has drawn it out. So I mentioned the inequities in maternal and infant health, 
in, in our state, they're about as, I mean, they're, they're just horrific, right? And uh, there's no justification for it. And one of the problems we have, though, is the data is really outdated. And so there are some small proposals in the governor's budget that stem from this goal review, this, this sort of this goal process to get at more data faster uh, to help us unpack and address these issues. So um, I think restarting this process, getting the agencies focused on proactive goals that get at the issues you're raising uh, Councilmember Ferguson uh, is are critical, and then we've tried to reflect it in the budget. So you know, but internally we've got a great crosswalk document from MMB that shows us how our budget proposals line up with our goals and our priorities, and I think that's that's key. It doesn't mean that it's not a huge challenge; it is. Um, but I'm grateful to you for flagging it because it's exactly the challenge we have to be focused on. Because this last year has been devastating. So thank you. And and I would just make one final just comment. You have a very talented group of people around this table. And you know we keep being told we're part of the administration. Leverage the people around this table, right? If there's ways you got you have business owners, you have union representatives, you have former mayors, uh, you have people that were worked at Greater MSP, you know, you have people that are leaders in different spaces around our state. And I feel like we're not personally like we're not part of it. We're not being leveraged. You got some great talent in in, in this table that you could be leveraging in the administration to uh, help tackle some of these problems. I think that's great, and I and I would welcome, I would welcome any and all. Uh, uh, you know, the, the more specific, I mean, I, I appreciate that. We want to do that, and any specific ideas you have, whether it's any of the council members or or, or Chair Zelli about how to do it and, and how we can and how we can do that better. Happy to do it. Completely agree. We can we can do more on that front. Thank you. Thank you. All right. La last question, Linnea. It's yours. Thank you, Chair. I um. We had a meeting, uh, Council Member Ferguson and myself with Chris, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and um, her aide in November. And we had a really specific conversation about what we were hoping to learn and hear. And so what I'm hoping is that we can actually um, get a response on some of those things we were looking for and talked about in that conversation. So I, I would just ask, and you know, and I, I'd followed up with um, an email, but uh, you know, that it, that would be really helpful um, to show that we're actually moving forward and not spinning our wheels or or pretending that conversation didn't take place. Or I, 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 I guess I, I don't have as much of a question as what we were expecting and hoping to hear today is that we know in our own data and it mirrors the data at the state level. African Americans specifically to Chris, Chris's point earlier, when we talk and disaggregate the data, when we talk about BIPOC, we're seeing overrepresentation of Asian and even in some cases American Indian communities. But oftentimes when we see that overrepresentation in American Indian communities, especially when we're talking about businesses, they might be one business that's doing all the work. Um, so it's not spreading across the community. But what we really see is our largest single non-white population in our state, which is African-American, have 50% unemployment, and we have not heard a single plan to address that. But what, what I did hear this fall, which was the impetus for my call and, and, and asked for conversation, was a lack of tolerance of the expression of outrage and hopelessness that that community was feeling and experiencing. But we've tolerated subpar education, We've tolerated the fact that in Minneapolis, a white man with a felony is more likely to be employed than a black man with a college education. We tolerated high school students not getting benefits for unemployment and then being told when the grocery store in their community is closed, when they don't have a job, when their parents don't have a job and they have no food, that it's wrong for them to do something and be angry. And so I apologize for my emotion today and I apologize that this might come across to some folks listening to this as um, in a way that they can't hear. But what I was really am hurt by is that we had a very specific conversation and wanted to hear what is the plan. And what I heard today was not a plan. Um, it was more of what we've been doing and creating goals at a high level, but we have an acute issue that people are suffering with right now and we have failed over and over again to move the needle on the single largest non-white population in our state. And we, if I Google Walsh and equity, 
what comes up is not good because there's nothing there for this. I see it in education in this year's budget, but I really would like a response to those questions. And honestly, when we talk about disaggregating the data, I would really like an honest conversation about where we are perpetually failing. And what is the plan to respond? I want to be a part of the solution, which is why I'm at this table. I want to be used if I can be of assistance. I want to be challenged for us at the Met Council to do better at what we need to be do better at. I want to get those marching orders, and I want us to be empowered to do that. But I wanted to just share, and my question is, where is that information, Chris? And can we still get it? Can we get that plan? What's the response? for this population that is suffering. Yeah, and I would say, so I appreciate that. And I would say a, a couple of things. So one, I, I don't, first of all, I don't think when you said, I mean, I, I appreciate your candor and I don't, you know, when you said, I mean, don't apologize at all. I, I appreciate it, it's helpful. And I don't, I uh, um, I would say, first off, I, we talked to the Lieutenant Governor. I, we didn't think that this presentation ran that so sort of far Sort of far off off base of what you were asking for, but but if there are pieces that were missing, I hear you, and, and we can circle back on those pieces, one hundred percent. But I, I your your I, I hear your frustration completely, and appreciate your candor very very much. And um and I think you know I think I would say this. So one, I've just I've got the data off to the side. Let me just just on the specific issue of procurement, I would say, I, I, I but it's important as you raised it that in addition, I would say just specific on the state spend. Um, the disaggregated data, for instance, that Alice Roberts Davis is working on in equity and procurement has also shown a, a meaningful improvement in state spend on black owned businesses. So that, that that's a good thing. That, that That's a minor piece of the puzzle, if you will, because state procurement only is part of the puzzle. But I, you're, you're right on the point of disaggregation, uh, 100%, and we have to have the data and we've got to be targeted. And so I think it would be helpful to have Commissioner Roberts Davis come back just on that point and speak and answer more questions on equity and procurement. Um, and, and then I would, and then I would say this: uh, I don't, you know, um, I, I hear you on sort of, you know, googling the googling the governor, governor in equity. Uh, I think, you know, for us, um, as I've said, we think there's a lot of in, in importance in in sort of laying out our values and our priorities across the enterprise. This plan, this building blocks document, has gone out to, uh, and we can do it easily. I don't, I don't know. Uh, our ability to do it at my council, but it's gone out to 40,000 state employees uh, to show that we're targeted. You know, the the equity lens has been applied in the form A that, that every agency has to respond to before they can make a budget or policy request to the governor's office. And then I think on on the on the economic front, again, I think Commissioner you know Commissioner Grove and others can, from Deed can come back and speak to it. But they and and uh, uh, McDalia is also engaged in this work. Um, we, we have to set a clear marker. On, on an equitable economic recovery, you know, and I don't, you know, I guess I would go back to the budget. I don't think that uh, I hear you on the point about the angel tax credit, for instance, but I also think we tried to build into the budget, um, you know, sort of targeted programming that would help, you know, for instance, Commissioner Olson from OHE spent much of the last year working on a, on a stabilization program that would allow folks who've been especially displaced economically over the course of the last year uh, to get at free college um, or free job training programming uh, to help in what's next. And so I also think that the whole budget has uh, that, that, that we've tried, not just in the education space, but in the economic recovery space, tried to take action there. Um, but, but, but I hear you on, on okay, I, I want to see that. Uh, I want to see the equity piece articulated publicly and want to see that plan. And I think our, our team from DEED, uh, I'd be happy to come back with them, can come back and speak to that concretely and how we tried to build that into our budget. Um, but there's more we need to do for sure. Well, you know, we've already overextended your time. Uh, but uh, Chris, Chris and uh, Big Dahlia, thank you so much. I mean, clearly uh, you sense uh, the passion, the interest, the, the work that we at Met Council want to be good partners and know that this is something we're all collectively um, working on as a, as a, the highest priority for the uh, region and the state that we love. Um, so stay tuned. You're welcome anytime. Uh, and we will 
Uh, I know as individuals uh, talk soon, but uh, we'll continue the conversation and some of these ideas to follow up, particularly with uh, Commissioner Alice Davis Johnson, uh, also uh, uh, Commissioner Grove, others. Um, we'll continue uh, to follow up. So, yeah, thank uh, you. With that, I, 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 again, I appreciate I appreciate the candor very very much, and and know that you know there's there are so many friends we have to be working on, and and the more ideas and specific ways that, that you see we can improve, the better. And and I would just make I would I would uh, just make another plug for. There's also this the the incredibly uh, urgent work of the of the of the vaccine and COVID that we're doing now, and and I want to thank McDally in particular, who's you know leading our CRR and pushing on data, and and pushing on okay you know we're we have teams trying to stand up you know vaccine programs and community pharmacies that uh, serve uh, uh, neighborhoods with, that are predominantly communities of color. We have uh, vaccine channels going to our FQHCs. There are also some specific pieces I forgot to mention that we have got to get right. In vaccine, that's extremely challenging, and and especially when the feds are emphasizing um, speed and the, and the and the threat of, of sort of allocation based on speed. So, just want to reflect on that work and ask as as you can give us feedback on that as you think about your own constituencies. The more, the better. So, no, I appreciate it, uh, each and every one of you. Thank you, thank you for the feedback, and please do let's stay in touch. All right. Well, we'll stay in tune. We'll stay in touch. Uh, Stay tuned, and uh, thank you, everybody, for everything that we're all doing. And uh, again, Chris, Chris, McDonald, thank you for all for your work, and we will uh, we'll pick it up. Uh, the thank meeting you. is adjourned. Right. Thank you. Enjoy the day. Yeah.